All right, so you can see I've got these divided anatomically, and we'll start with septal abnormalities. This one just has to be called out. It's not that exciting because it doesn't result in symptoms and requires no treatment. Uh, but there it is, unbelievable atrial septal fat infiltration. This can be really striking, and you just it can be to such a point that you can't believe it's normal. Look at, in fact, the thing that always amazes me about it is that it pinches the SVC in such a way. It's hard to believe that's benign. Look at that. The SVC is pinched down to a little slit right before it enters the right atrium, but it is physiologically inconsequential. I think the most important thing about this is not to confuse it with the other fatty entity of the heart, which is a myxoma. In fact, uh, in my days when I was uh, doing these more actively, uh, people would write me instant messages or call me and say, hey, I think I've got a myxoma. And I would always roll my eyes and I would think, 90% eh, it's going to be fatty infiltration of the septum, right? So all that is fat is not a myxoma. And we're going to look at a myxoma and see that they don't look very much alike at all. All right, so that is benign atrial septal fatty infiltration. Our next septal case, this is a great case of an ASD. You can see with left to right shunting this time, so the exact type you would expect in an uncomplicated ASD. The thing I always remember about this case is I did not spot the ASD right off. And the reason is I have a search pattern and, and it, it actually, I hang my head in shame, it was taught me by my old cardiologist partner who said the best search pattern for coronary CTA is to follow the flow of blood. And he's absolutely right. So I was doing that. I followed the SBC down into the right atrium, into the right ventricle. And I remember I, I went past that septum without spotting that. But look at that right ventricle. I remember I was scrolling down through it and just thought, God, this is going on forever, right? And that was the first thing I noted was just the size of that right ventricle and how it was far too large. See, it extends way inferiorly, much farther than it should. So then I went back up and spotted that pretty easily. You got to get it in just the right contrast phase, of course, but we certainly did in this instance. That is a nice case of an ASD with left to right shunting. All right, you may have noticed I really like initial presentation cases. In fact, uh, that's pretty much the case across the board unless I'm trying to demonstrate a postoperative complication. Uh, it's hard to find a VSD where there hasn't been intervention, right? Because they don't generally let these sit around. Uh, but I thought this was interesting. This You can see uh, an acute one beginning to form here. This is the membranous portion of the septum that is weakened and bowing out, and there is left to right shunting just dying to start, but that hasn't quite yet. You can see that exact distribution of the membranous septum and that bowing, just incredible, a contained VSD that has yet to rupture, but uh, certainly it's going to need fixing relatively soon. So an interesting case. I've got a couple of pinhole VSDs, but that one was the one I thought uh, most striking. All right, let's move to some valvular stuff. So we've already seen uh, a few valvular complications. We're gonna round that out with some gated studies now. So uh, this is a favorite in all courses in coronary CTA. They will throw one of these in, and that's the atrial appendage filling defect. This one is complete and I think unquestionable. This is a clot. Uh, these can be tough and I'll show you some other examples where they're pretty tricky. Look at the mitral valve cusps. They're thick, they're irregular, they're calcified. Uh, they're, they're completely asymmetric. This one is not tough, I don't think, uh, to call mitral stenosis on. They're also a little too close together. Now, remember, these studies are done in end diastole. So that means the aortic valve should be closed and the mitral valve should be open. Now the mitral valve leaflets do drift back towards a neutral position after initially opening fairly wide, right? So they will drift back a little bit, but this is too far and the distortion of the cusps is such, 
I think you can easily call stenosis here. Obviously, you can't call regurgitation very well uh, in the mitral valve, and you can't call stenosis in the aortic valve very well, right? Because of the expected position of those valves. But we'll see, you can uh, divine some of these uh, with additional findings. Okay, so look at that cutoff there of the atrial appendage, and I'll go back up and show you that. Look how smooth that interface with the native atrium is. Right? You never see any contrast going into the atrial appendage. And that's pretty typical of a thoroughly clotted atrial appendage. You know what, I spotted this and I thought I might as well just point it out. You see these all the time, they're little accessory appendages coming off the left atrium. They probably represent rudimentary uh, pulmonary venous connections. But these, uh, these are pretty common and uh, can be ignored. They're of no clinical significance. Okay, look at that annular calcification and even valve cusp calcification there in the mitral valve. We'll watch that again. Okay, so thrombosed atrial appendage. And now that annular calcification. And look at the thickening and irregularity of those valve cusps. So it all fits together, right? You've got stasis, a little bit of left atrial enlargement, but probably stasis in that appendage uh, related to mitral stenosis that ultimately uh, resulted in its thrombosis. All right, another valvular one. This one's the atrial myxoma. But this, I wanted to point out this first. This is incomplete filling in the tip of the left atrial appendage, right? It's wispy. There's uh, an ill-defined interface between it and the, more, and the remainder of the appendage. And you'll even see some pectinate muscles on the movie. And when you can distinguish those sorts of anatomic features, it's a lot less likely uh, that this is thrombosis. It can be tricky, and you can always try to do a delayed image if you catch it on the scanner. Uh, ultimately, you may have to just say, I can't tell. And so don't be, don't be embarrassed if that happens. All right, so there is a huge fat density mass in the left atrium. In the left atrium, that's where myxomas almost always occur. Note it's arising from the interatrial septum from a focal point. Also very typical of this, right? So it doesn't look anything like the atrial septal fatty infiltration that we saw earlier. Uh, but, you know, fat is fat in the heart, and uh, it's an easy mistake to make. There's a little focus of calcification, not uncommon in the larger myxomas. The other thing that I really love about this case is that thing sticking its nose down through the mitral valve. One of my favorite lines from Harrison's Internal Medicine, which, yes, I did read uh, back in those darker days, um, it was that the atrial myxoma can cause wrecking ball damage to the mitral valve. I just loved that. They can, they're frequently pedunculated, right? And can really be whacking on the mitral valve uh, with every atrial contraction. You can see that's actually happening here, right? There's probably physical damage occurring to those mitral valve leaflets. So there, see the pectinate musculature there? That was the incomplete filling of the left atrial appendage. Let's look at that again. There are the pectinates, see that? And here's the myxoma, and sticking its nose down through the mitral valve. Incomplete filling, myxoma. This is a beauty, huh? This took me an entire afternoon uh, the particular 3D viewer I had access to wasn't uh, very export friendly, but boy, did it make pretty pictures, huh? Pretty incredible. So there is that left side. There is the mass sticking down through the mitral valve. Okay, so that is a left atrial myxoma. Our next valve case, this one is a bicuspid valve. So you can see there are two normally formed aortic valve cusps, and then there's this one little vestige here. On these gated studies, you can often pick this up in bicuspid valves. There will be just this tiny little smidgen of uh, vestigial cusp instead of complete absence. So there are the two normal cusps, and then there's that one posterior vestige. And there it is. 
So that is a bicuspid valve that can be associated with a number of other abnormalities, probably most commonly coarctation. And there it is on the coronal as well. You can see two normal cusps coapting there and then that third little vestige. So that is a bicuspid aortic valve. All right, this is an aortic stenosis. And yes, the aortic valve should be closed at end diastole on a coronary study. So this can be a very difficult call to make and you've got to qualify it every time you do. But we've got much like that mitral valve case, right? We've got uh, irregular thickened valve cusps. We've got a lot of calcification. And then we can go on these secondary findings that are so important here, right? There is definitely left ventricular thickening that suggests a lot of resistance to outflow, right? And there's also a little dilation of the aortic root suggesting turbulent flow due to a jet lesion. So there's that thickened LV. You see that dilated aortic root. Very thick cusp. They almost look fused together, don't they? That's got to be a tight, tight valve. So don't go crazy and try and uh, call percentages or this or that, but say hemodynamically and likely clinically significant aortic stenosis for that one. And there it is on the coronal. And really appreciate the uh, LV hypertrophy. Also the thickening of those cusps and their apparent fusion. Okay, so that's an aortic stenosis. Let's go to the other extent, the aortic regurgitation. Now, this is one you can call, right? The aortic valve should be closed here in end diastole. And you can see very clearly the three cusps come together and do not coapt. You're going to have a retrograde jet of um, blood coming out of the aortic root and back down into the left ventricle through that central gap you see right there. There's obviously the secondary findings are very helpful here. There's massive dilation of the aorta as well as the LV, right? This is a core bovinum. You'd see a little ectopic, uh, a few ectopic beats there in the earlier phases on this image. Big, dilated, and not very hypertrophied left ventricular myocardium. And look at that failure of coaptation, just beautiful. You can practically picture the retrograde jet that would allow. So failure of coaptation, that is a classic aortic regurgitation, patient with a water hammer pulse. All right, one more valvular case. I hope everybody spots this because we saw it on the non-gated study. This is a valve ring abscess. Right, so that same spot, very high in the muscular septum, right, right adjacent to the aortic valve, you've got erosion and contrast material there. In addition, this one shows a vegetation, and that vegetation is in on the outflow in the aortic outflow, right? So it is proximal or upstream from the valve, and that's a very important point. Uh, lastly, pericardial fluid, which just like the previous study, is going to represent a pyopericardium here. So here is the erosion, right, adjacent to the aortic valve ring. And now let's look at that. This is a bicuspid valve, by the way, and note that vegetation sticking down, right, upstream against the flow of blood into the outflow tract. All right, so note again, it is a bicuspid valve. See that? There's the erosion. And then we'll go through again and we'll have a green circle around that vegetation. There it is. Okay, so uh, I saw a case once of a fibroelastoma. It was sitting right above the valve and it was a little pedunculated, rounded density. And I got all excited and I called the doctor, the referring, and I said, This is a case of endocarditis. And the guy said, Isn't it? downstream from the valve? And I said, yes. And he said, well, endocarditis vegetations don't do that. So important point. <laughs> I guess I was glad to learn it then. 
I actually didn't realize that, and I've looked it up ever since, and, and it is definitely true. For whatever reason, endocarditis vegetations tend to be upstream against flow, right? If it's downstream, it's more likely something else, whether it's morantic or uh, a tumor or what have you. But uh, this is a classic location for an endocarditis vegetation. And of course, with a bicuspid valve, you know, you've got some altered dynamics and it might just uh, add to this patient's risk when they get bacteremic, right, that they might develop this. Uh, certainly that creates jet lesions and mucosal weaknesses and could have been a contributory factor here. Of course, IV drug use uh, is probably more contributory. Okay, so there's that ring abscess. And then we'll go back through and look at that little vegetation dangling down in the outflow tract, being right there. Pretty cool. 